Hey everyone, it's Rob B here with Rob D and you are listening to the Property Podcast and this week we're going to give you the five best performing areas in the UK for property growth and I bet you couldn't guess a single one of them, but let's see. Welcome to the Property Podcast. Thank you for joining us. Yes, in case you don't know, we buy more than £100 million worth of property per year for our clients. You can find out about that at propertyhub.net slash invest. And that means that we are very interested in where the best places to invest are. And in this episode, we're not going to just tell you where they are. We're going to tell you why they are the best areas and how to use that information to find the best investment locations for you. So stick around. Last week, we updated you on the election. We talked about the parties involved in the election, the major ones anyway. We talked about some of their key policies. But of course, this is a moving feast. Lots is happening and there is more news to bring you. And this time from the Labour Party, because Angela Rayner has been talking about the rental sector, Rob, and a lot of it is repeating of what's been said before. So the no, the no fault evictions are going to be introduced, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there was a couple of other bits that you spotted in here that hasn't been said before that certainly raised our eyebrows. Yeah, it's a little bit strange because they've just brought out a manifesto and you'd have thought that would set out their thinking on housing and all other topics. But Angela Rainick gave a speech and this was echoed by a speech that Keir Starmer gave afterwards where they chucked in a couple of new housing policies that we hadn't heard of before. So they repeated all the stuff about no-fault evictions, legal protections for mould, etc, etc. But then she said that they were going to put an end to rental bidding wars and upfront payments. So this was just a speech, so we're left interpreting what they mean. But I think what they mean by rental bidding wars is a property is advertised for a price that if someone really wants it, they'll offer a higher price and someone might offer a higher price again. Another way that someone might secure a property if they really wanted it or if they weren't able to do it another way would be to offer a year's worth of rent upfront. And that upfront payment is something that apparently they're going to cap. They're not saying don't, not allow it, but not cap it. And this just struck me as really odd, because while we obviously don't have the detail, it's strange that they're throwing in new policies when they've just had a manifesto. And how do you even do that, especially putting an end to bidding wars? Is it just like it's advertised at a price and no one's allowed to pay above the price? Does that just mean that everyone will start advertising the properties at really high prices and people will be bidding below that really high price? And what's this all for anyway? Essentially, you've got a scarce resource, which is housing. You've got more demand than supply. And they're trying to remove all the different mechanisms by which supply can be allocated. So I can only imagine you advertise your property for a price, you get 50 different bids at that price, and you have to just pick a number out of a hat or something. It's really weird. <laughs> it is weird. And as you pointed out, Rob, because it's not in the manifesto and because it wasn't part of a debate, it's also lacking a lot of detail. So it could be as bad as you've just made out. It could be not quite as bad. It's hard to tell. It doesn't sound good, though. It's hard to, I know I like positivity. It's hard to put a positive spin on this one. Hopefully common sense will prevail because let's face it, Labour will win. But if you've not listened to last week's episode where we cover the election, I strongly urge you to do that. And we also talk about voting as a property investor during that episode as well. And I think that's really interesting. I think that's something powerful that you should listen to. So do consume all the information available. We're trying to put out as much as possible. And of course, we'll keep you updated on the election leading up to it and after it and all its impacts. I'm really excited about this week's episode. Because, yes, we're going to reveal the top five performing areas in England. And don't worry, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales will give you your top areas as well. But the reason I'm excited is I don't think anyone would guess these areas. And they're from a report that most people never read. We often report to you the best performing cities. And we refer to a report by Home Track for those top 20 cities. And at the time of this report coming out, the number one cities in England for performance were Sheffield, Manchester and Leeds. So Sheffield might be a surprise, but certainly Leeds and Manchester are areas that we've put in our hotspots for this year, part of our predictions for top areas this year. So it's clearly no surprise to us. But it's the areas that don't normally get reported in a much bigger report of 65 towns and cities that are really interesting, really, really interesting. And that is what we're going to reveal today, but not just tell you what they are, but more importantly, give you our view on why they're performing so well. Now, Rob, before we anger the nations, should we start with reporting on the top area, which isn't a town or city in England, but it's actually in Northern Ireland, 
and it's Belfast. And Rob, what staggers me with Belfast, and we've talked about it for years now, there's only two areas in the whole of the UK that still have not recovered to 08 levels. So when we had the 08 crash, everywhere fell, and everywhere bar two areas have recovered. But Belfast is not just a couple of percent to go and then it's recovered to 08 levels. It's still 21% below its peak in the last property cycle. That's mental. So it's probably no surprise that it's topping the charts because it's got so far to go. It's insane, isn't it? 21% below. And that's in nominal terms. I've just looked it up. Inflation since then has been 57%. So it's I think unbelievably far below. I don't know how much of that comes from it being like really overpriced at the time versus how much of that comes from it having struggled more recently. I imagine it's largely to do with the overpriced factor. But like you said, no surprise that it is at the top of the list because, yeah, it's got some ground to make up. I think it's really interesting that the area that has the furthest to go to catch up to 07, 08 levels is top of the charts. The bottom of the charts is the area that's outperformed the 07, 08 peak by the most. So Hastings is bottom of the charts. So over the last 12 months, it's down by 2.9%, but it's 72% over its last peak. So it's not as simple as going, okay, well, which areas have the most to go? You know, where are they compared to 08 prices? But there is definitely some link and some coloration between the two. It's interesting to see that Belfast, with 21% below its 0708 peak is top, and Hastings, 72% above its 0708 peak, is the worst performer. Before we get into the top five of England, honourable mentions for Glasgow and Swansea, who are the top performers for Scotland and Wales, and also can be found near the top of the charts. So strong performers for those who are looking to invest in Scotland and for those investing in Wales, they have been performing very, very strongly. Although Glasgow is in Scotland, and as we've reported on many times, the rent controls and the anti-landlord sentiment that seems to be from the leadership there means that it's not an area that Rob and I would invest in. But house prices are doing well. Okay, so like we said, this report covers 65 towns and cities, and we'll run through those at the very top. But let's start with the big guns. What if we isolate the biggest cities, the ones that make up the main list of 20 that we typically reference on the show? Let's go through first, second, and third. Well, first is Sheffield. Sheffield up 1.5% year on year. Whenever we don't include Sheffield in our hotspots, we always get a few messages saying, thanks for not including Sheffield. I invest there and I don't want anyone else being let in on the secret. But it seems like the word may be getting out. Sheffield over the last decade probably has not performed as strongly as it feels like it should do. But maybe its time is now coming because it's outranking Manchester, which is in second place. Manchester, of course, has been on an absolute tear for the last five, six years, consistently at the top of the list. Well, now, according to this report, it's fallen to number two. And then in third place, we've got Leeds, another city that's been a consistently strong performer. It hasn't topped the list for a long time, but it's been consistently in the top five and it's in third place here. But Rob, here's the big twist. These are all outranked by the smaller areas we're about to cover right now. They are. So let's hold back. Let's give you the areas. And actually, I'm going to group them together because I feel there's reasons why these areas are performing so well. So I'm going to give you first, second, and fourth on the list. First is Blackburn. Yes, Blackburn is the top performer. It's 3.3% year-on-year growth. In a time over the last 12 months that hasn't been exactly stellar for property, that's certainly outperforming the market. Second is Burnley with 2.1% growth. And fourth in this list is Bolton with 1.8% growth. Now, for those who are up on their geography, you may already have clicked why I've grouped them together. And the reason I've grouped them together is two of them are in Greater Manchester, and one of them is just outside, but still very commutable to Manchester. So Rob's giving you Sheffield, Manchester and Leeds as the highest performing main cities. But I think without trying to upset the people of Sheffield, Manchester and Leeds, you would class as like mega cities, like big cities. Sheffield, great city. I've lived there for a few months, lovely place. 
a long time ago now, but Leeds and Manchester are just on a much bigger scale and economically more powerful as well. And that is reflected here in the data because Manchester at second has seen different commuter areas all benefiting from the Manchester effect, or as you often will hear us refer to on the podcast, the ripple effect. So the Manchester ripple effect has helped Blackburn, Burnley and Bolton all make the top five. They are all very quick commutes into Manchester, but also all are seeing different levels of regen going on within those areas, particularly Bolton. Bolton is being transformed at the moment and a lot of money is being pumped into Bolton and it's really coming on and the plans for the future are very exciting. So it's no surprise at all for me and Rob at least to see Bolton in that top five. But you may be surprised because it's completely understandable for you to gravitate to the bigger cities to think what's the top performers. But no, it's ripple effect areas that are really performing well. And we'll talk more about how you can take advantage of that as an investor shortly. But Rob, I think we should also reveal, because it's a very similar theme here, our joint fifth performers. Because there's two areas with exactly the same level of growth and they also have benefited from another mega city. Yes, they have. So in joint fifth, you've got Bradford and Huddersfield. What do they have in common? Well, they are very close to Leeds. So it seems right, like we're seeing exactly the same thing here. You've got the Manchester ripple effect benefiting Blackburn, Burnley and Bolton. We've also got Bradford, so maybe it's an alphabet thing. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> the alphabet is helpful because it also benefits the next one we're going to talk about as well. But Huddersfield sneaking in there as well makes me suspect that it's not just starting with the letter B. It's proximity to one of those thriving cities. It's the ripple effect again. It certainly is. But there's one outlier here that is not benefiting from the ripple effect from either of those two cities, but does make the top five. And sitting in third place in England is Derby. Rob, feeling pretty smug with this one. (laughs) Because Derby is an area that we've championed now for maybe approaching two years on the podcast. And when we started, just like we did many years ago with Manchester, we said, this doesn't make sense. The fundamentals are too strong for the house prices of that area. There's a disparity here. And that normally means that you're going to see capital growth. And that has started to be delivered. And that's why Derby is sitting in third. But for those who've not heard us wax lyrical about Derby and why we rated so highly, do you want to give everyone the headlines of why it's such a strong area for investment? Yeah, so the super quick version of this is, first of all, you've got general geographical location. So like you've got these cities doing strongly, the East Midlands in general doing well, Nottingham down the road doing well. So you could say, oh, ripple effect from Nottingham, but maybe not because according to this list, Nottingham prices have actually declined by 0.4% over the last year, whereas Derby is kicking on. Why could that be? But it's because Derby very much stands on its own TV. It's got some major employers in the automotive and engineering sectors, and that means there are a lot of jobs and a lot of high skill, high wage jobs. And one of the consequences of that is that wages in Derby are among the highest in the country. Obviously, London is top of that list, but Derby is up there as well. And because the cost of living in Derby is lower, disposable income in Derby is the highest in the country. So what you've got is a high skilled, relatively high earning population and both rents and property prices that are relatively low. So clearly, you've got a gap there. And when that happens, unfortunately for most people involved, what tends to happen is property prices take some of that. House prices go up, rents go up. But the other thing you see in Derby, Rob, and you told me to be brief, (laughs) I'm not being particularly brief, I think this is worth mentioning, you've also got some major city centre regeneration going on in Derby. So you can say a lot of nice things about Derby. Waxing lyrical about the town centre has not historically been one of them, but there are some major developments going on there now that's providing not only a better city centre, but also the kind of high-spec city centre homes that these high earners actually want to live in, but just haven't existed until now. And I think that's a pattern we're seeing in some of these areas, and it's reflected in some other areas that haven't quite made the top five that you might want to touch on as well, where yes, it's proximity, the ripple effect is really powerful, but there's something specific going on with that area itself, some kind of catalyst that's causing that area to benefit over and above simply being close to somewhere else that's doing well. Absolutely, Rob. And I'll round up the rest of the top 10 in a moment, but... I said earlier that, you know, smug that Derby's made the list, but actually it's just common sense stuff. And not just for Derby, for a few of these, like Bolton as well. Manchester performing strongly, incredible cities, massive success story, economically super strong, area nearby, seeing lots of regeneration, 
It's performed well in property prices. Like, it's not hard to see. Derby, average wages are super high. Property prices aren't. Loads of money going into the centre. The result, capital growth. It's not that hard. I think what some of the experts struggle to do when they try and pick areas is they just keep picking the areas that are doing strong now and just hope it continues. But there are opportunities to spot these areas early on before others do and then really benefit from the upside. But to be very clear, the likes of Derby and Bolton have only just started to go up. So there's some real opportunity still to be had there. And I think the lesson here is you can spot areas like that there's another area in the top 10 which very much fulfills that criteria, which is Doncaster. Massive, massive employment in that area. Ridiculously strong employment. Possibly the strongest rental market in the UK. It's ridiculously strong. Property just flies off the shelves when it's put up for let. It's crazy. Loads of money going into the area. So Doncaster also makes up the top 10. But the others in here, if I said to you, guess what potentially could be here, if you said other areas in Greater Manchester and surrounding Leeds, you'd be correct. Wigan, Greater Manchester, Rochdale, Greater Manchester, both making the top 10. And Barnsley also makes the top 10, another area that's benefiting from the Leeds ripple effect. So Manchester, Leeds, very, very strong cities. And if you've got the budget to invest in there, they're like your Londons of the North right now. Very strong economically. Not an area that needs money to become great. It already is great, but more money keeps piling in. And if your budget will allow you, great places to invest. But if you want a piece of that pie, but you can't quite stretch to that level, well, then I feel you've got two choices. You have the hotspot choice of places like Derby and Doncaster, which aren't benefiting from ripple effects, but are performing very strongly for all the reasons we've mentioned, or loads of areas surrounding Manchester and Leeds, which are absolutely benefiting from the ripple effect and make up the majority of the top 10. Again, it's just simple stuff. If you can't quite afford the areas that are the centre of growth right now, which is currently Manchester and Leeds, then look to the areas nearby because if they haven't gone up yet, they will start to. And you can see that reflected in this data. And Rob, I think that's the point of property investment, something we try to get across over and over again. And unfortunately, it means that we don't look like some great sages, that most of property investment and that extended to economics is just common sense principles. But unfortunately, it seems that common sense isn't that common. No, it's really not that hard. The likes of Manchester and Leeds have been obvious for, like, what, a decade now, pretty much. And once you understand some of these forces we've talked about that cause areas to grow, so you've got the ripple effect and ideally you've got some kind of catalyst as well, then that's pretty obvious as well. I think it's worth saying as well, Rob, that we talk about areas a lot. And the reason we do that is that it makes a real difference. Now, obviously, in every one of the 65 cities on this list, there will be people making property investment work for them. They'll be pursuing their own strategies. They'll be finding great deals. They'll be doing refurbs. They'll be making it work really well. But if you're investing in the way that we do, you're trying to buy, hold and maximize your total return over time, rental income plus capital growth then where you invest makes a massive difference. Just within the last year, top growth of 4.5% to bottom down 2.9%. That's a heck of a spread. And that's just one year. And obviously, if it was random every year, there's nothing you can do with this because you're not going to buy a different portfolio every single year. But the point is that these trends play out over a really long time. Like you said, Rob, you can do well in any area, but I don't like to have to do it on hard mode. And if you invest in places like Worthing, Brighton, Norwich, Ipswich, Hastings, which are all bottom of the table right now, that's playing in hard mode. I like easy mode. I like picking places that are performing really well. And hopefully nowadays, maybe not always, but nowadays I do pick great investments. If I do get it wrong and I pick an average one, but I picked a great area, then I'm still going to be looked after. So it's like an extra level of protection. If you don't do a brilliant deal, but you do pick a brilliant area, then you'll still be fine. But if you don't do a brilliant deal in the areas that aren't performing right now and house prices are falling in those areas, then you can actually be really punished and set yourself back several years. So for me, and I'm sure many people listening, playing it in easy mode is a far more favourable way to go. But by taking in what we've talked about today, being able to spot future hotspots yourself or just taking advantage of the ripple effect, you too can invest on easy mode rather than hard mode. Indeed. And if you want to check out that full list that we've been talking about, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. But before we wrap up, let's leave you with Hub Extra, the part of the show where we bring you 
some extra resource, a tool, a way of thinking about life that we think will add some value to your week. Rob, you do the honours this week. What have you got for us? I love metrics. I love the business metrics. I love looking at how we're doing. I love looking at our podcast metrics. I love numbers. I love reports. And I know a lot of people listening will love it as well, whether it's your investment portfolio or any other areas of interest in your life. But for me, there's a set of data and numbers that you should be obsessed with that most people are not. And once I started being interested in these numbers, a lot change for me in a very positive way. And that is looking at your own numbers, your blood work numbers, or any other data that you can get. So recently, I got myself a whoop band. And this is not an endorsement. I'm only a few weeks in. I'm not saying go out and get yourself a whoop band. But what a whoop band does is it gives you different data on yourself. And I find it really interesting. And it's already started to modify my behaviours. Now, it's early days, and I may change and I'm not saying everyone listening go out and get a whoop band. But something I found even more powerful was getting blood work done and getting lots and lots of different results and looking at those results and saying, okay, what needs to be improved? And then either through diet, supplementation, or exercise, changing my behaviours to improve those numbers. Years ago, for people who used to listen to the podcast many, many years ago, I used to talk about having afternoon naps because I was so tired. And I just thought, oh man, you know, I'm just getting older. I'm working really hard, running a business, having a family. It's just tiring me out. That was probably all true. But what was also true is my health wasn't where it needed to be. I've got more energy now than I had 10 years ago. And that is because I paid attention to my numbers. And if you prioritize your numbers, getting blood work done. There's loads of places online you can get it done. Just do a search. I'm not going to recommend one brand. There are plenty of places, but get your blood work done. Understand your own numbers. If you do exercise in gym, things like a whoop band or a aura ring or similar, Apple Watch can do a lot of it as well. Get your numbers and then, okay, that's my benchmark. How can I improve my personal KPIs? it will be the greatest investment you ever make because you will operate more efficiently throughout your life, not just as a property investor, but everything else that's important to you. We've talked about some interesting things today on the podcast, but if I can only get you to do one thing, it's not invest in the the next hotspot. It's not invest in a, a ripple effect area. It's get your health metrics, work on them and enjoy the benefits. Well, there you go. How much life advice do you want in one podcast? We've told you how to figure out where to invest and we've told you how to stick around long enough to benefit from the capital growth and to enjoy your life along the way. Completely endorse everything you've just said, Rob. So that is us done for this week. Thank you so much for listening and we'll be back to do it all again next week. So we'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.